Look how small this thing is, though. I mean, it's it's not super light. I'm not super strong, but it's not super light. But it is itty bitty. I mean, it's smaller than a vinyl in, in square area. Area? Yeah, not volume, but area. You live in a small apartment. You have a small room dedicated for music listening or home theater. You don't have a lot of options that provide you low frequency bass. A lot of them out there are going to do 50 hertz and above pretty darn well, but you ask it to do it below that, good luck. How do I know? I've tested a boatload of subwoofers over the past couple years, and I'm speaking from experience. The KEF KC62 is designed to allow you to have lower frequency extension without a large space consumed. This is what you see over my shoulder here. It's the KEF KC62. Now, I want to go ahead and say up front, this doesn't have the SPL that a 15-inch subwoofer has or a 12-inch subwoofer has, but it does have good enough output on the low frequency end for smaller rooms or if you use multiples, then maybe medium-sized rooms. But don't think that this is going to fill the gap and provide you with tons and tons of low frequency bass for your home theater experience in a large room because you want something that looks small and cute. That's not what this is designed to do. And it seems to me that some people have ignored physics here and are claiming that this subwoofer can do way more than it can. And I'm here to tell you, let's tamper the expectations. But if your expectation is to have good lower frequency extension, within a reasonable sized room at a reasonable SPL level, then this subwoofer will do it. And in many regards, it actually performs better, better than I expected to. So let's talk about some of that. Now, before we dive in a couple quick notes and I'll show you a little video. This features a built-in class D amplifier with a thousand watts. Each driver gets two by 500 watts each. This subwoofer features two six and a half inch woofers, and they are aligned in a way that the magnets are shared between the two subwoofers. Like they took two subwoofers and they just smushed them together. In doing so, that allows them to save space, but it also provides force cancellation. So you probably have experienced or maybe even run into situations where you've built an enclosure for a subwoofer or maybe a two-way speaker, or you've touched one, touched the side of it, and you can feel the vibrations carry up through it. These speakers, the way they're set apart is... When they are active, they are going equal but opposite. So the cancellation of the vibrations throughout the enclosure is a strong feature of this particular subwoofer. And I will tell you that as I was playing it, I could put my hand on top of it and I couldn't really feel any vibration. This is like not with 70s pop music or 70s rock where you might get lucky to get down to 50 hertz. This was listening to rap music, stuff like Young Jeezy, where... Most of the tones are 30 hertz to 25 hertz, just strong, constant bass tones. And in my listening, what I will also tell you is that at lower volume, the subwoofer does a really good job of providing low frequency bass, even down into 20 hertz. But as you crank up the volume, what happens is the limiters on the subwoofer start to override the frequency response. And it basically says, all right, low end, you can't do as much as I'm asking you to do. So we're going to roll you guys off. And it's an active limiting feature. And you see this in all sorts of PA speakers. You see this in your car audio systems from the manufacturers. It's a protection feature. And that's what we run into with this. So, for example, when I'm listening to Young Jeezy in my bedroom, bedroom is pretty large. I'd say ballpark, maybe 17 by 17 square, maybe about nine foot ceilings. I'm just ballparking it. So it's a decent size space to fill. The subwoofer does a good job on the low end to fill in that 20 to 30 hertz with certain rap songs. And it does a really good job above that. That really isn't a problem above that. But as I'm increasing the volume from about 80 decibels to about 90 decibels, I can start to tell that the low end is being tapered off. So that 20 to 30 hertz is no longer as stout as it was at the lower volume. The 40, 50, 60 hertz, that mid-bass region is still plenty stout. 
So it's worth noting that when you buy a speaker like this, you have to keep in mind the SPL level. I'm trying to really hammer that home so the expectation is sincerely set and realistically set. Here's a picture of the back of the subwoofer and you can see a few different settings. First of all, you have phase set to 0, 0180. Uh, EQ is something I wanted to point out because you have different EQ presets for the subwoofer depending on how you plan to place the subwoofer. Now, first of all, mode is set to manual or LFE. So LFE is just bypassed whatever internal processing is going on with the subwoofer. And it's no different if you hooked it up to the LFE output of your AVR. That's exactly what LFE does. If you set it to manual, however, then you can enable these switches, room, wall, corner, cabinet, and apartment. Each of those switches tailor the frequency response to fit those particular scenarios, or at least in a generic sense. And I do have response measurements for that. So I'll show you what each of those settings will allow you to do and how it shapes the response. Crossover setting, volume gain setting, and then you've got your inputs, your outputs, and the ground lift switch. When I review subwoofers, it's honestly, it feels like I'm trying hard to find something to talk about because subwoofers are really just there to provide bass. There's not a lot to them as long as the enclosure is designed properly. Now, if you have an enclosure that's too small for a woofer, then you'll have resonant peaks. If you have an enclosure that is too large for the woofer, then you'll have very sloppy bass, basically meaning that there's a pun in there too, basically. All right, sorry. The sloppy bass would be because there's no real acoustic suspension for the woofer on the low end, and it's exceeding its excursion capabilities if you're throwing a little bit too much power at it, and you kind of run into those things. But when a subwoofer is designed properly, at least in regards to the airspace given to the drivers that are in it, or DSP is used to correct a response for maybe too small an enclosure, which would be considered a Linkwitz transform. If you want to go Google that, you're more than welcome to do that. Very, very common in powered subwoofers these days. Actually, extremely common in powered subwoofer these days. When you have a properly designed enclosure, you don't really have a lot of those things you talked about, or I talked about like the uh, resonant frequency being shifted too low or too high in the enclosure and causing ringing or causing sloppy bass. You usually just have a good overall bass performance. And then it really is up to you, your room, your placement, your integration with your mains that really makes or breaks the system. The majority of time that is the case. So what I like to do is I like to provide data because data is something I can point to and say, here's what you can expect, you know, in an ideal situation, outdoor ground plane measurement or anechoic measurement, free space. You know, this is what the response of the subwoofer itself is doing. And then when you put it into your room, you can say, okay, well, I'm expecting that it's going to roll off more quickly than this other subwoofer that I'm interested in. It's really just best used for comparative purposes. It's not the end all be all, but it does make an easy way for you to look and do comparisons. So what I want to show you guys is, first of all, the frequency response in LFE mode. And what I've got here on the screen is the actual Clipple results in the Clipple screen for the frequency response at 0.01 volt input. I've got about 69 decibels mean SPL from about 30 hertz to, let's say, I don't know, roughly 100 hertz, give or take, kind of draw an average in there if you wanted to. But there's not a lot of low end at that output. Now, if I increase the output to 0.1 volt, then I get closer to around 85, 86 decibels. And we can see that you do gain a little bit more output. If I increase the input to two volts input, then this is the maximum SPL capability that I was able to measure this subwoofer at. And what I wanna note is that, see the difference between this blue and this red line. There's a, what, about seven decibels or so between these two and the mid bass frequency. But look on the low end, they're starting to stack up on top of each other. Now this is the limiter or the compressor built in the subwoofer that protects the drivers from overexerting. This is what I was talking about when I said, as I was listening at lower volumes, the low bass was adequate, but as I increased the volume, the low bass was no longer as plentiful as the mid bass. And that's why we can see that here. That's what a limiter does. If I switch over to the room mode, switch over to manual and then switch over to room mode. Let's see what we got. Kind of the same story, not a whole lot of difference. And if I switch back, let's see if I can see a difference real fast. 
Yeah, not a whole lot of difference. The real difference is in the LFE mode, there is no low pass filter on the high end. And that just means that this is somewhat of a natural roll off native to the subwoofer itself with no signal processing applied to it. And then when I apply signal processing for room mode, it chops that top end off and, and gives it a roll off. And, and so, okay, that's all right. Now I didn't compare each of the individual modes at different volumes because I figured that's just, that's gonna, number one, it's gonna make my neighbors really mad. Uh, number two, I don't think there's a lot of useful information in doing that, but what I did do is I have provided the response at 0.1 volt input for all the different modes. So we have LFE in black, and we can see here that the roll off on the LFE is a lot more gradual on the top end than it is for all the other settings right here. That's what I talked about a second ago. If we look at room mode, and then we go to wall mode, we can see there's not a lot of difference there. There's just a little bit of difference maybe in that mid bass region around like 30 to 40 Hertz. And yes, I did triple check my settings because I thought, well, that's kind of odd, but okay, well, now we got have a better idea. There's a little bit of a difference there, not a whole lot. But in corner mode, we see some subtraction. It's about maybe three decibels or so between corner mode and room mode. And then if I go to cabinet mode compared to room mode, yeah, you can see there's more drop in the lower frequency. And if you go to apartment mode where you really don't want to piss off your neighbors, they have some tailoring done to the low frequency area below about 30 Hertz. It's more rolled off than it is in room mode. Now I also did do some CEA 2010A testing and I'll show you those results straight from the Clipple results. And here we go. At 20 Hertz, you're about 80 dB, 25, you're at about 85, uh, then 80, we'll round up to 89, then 92, then 95, 90, 98, 102, and then 104. If we switch from LFE mode over to the room mode, these are the results. And it's not a whole lot of difference, but there are some differences, particularly in the areas above about 50 Hertz. There's a couple more decibels in the LFE mode available. So the CEA 2010A results, you know, I, I do currently have other small subwoofers to compare against, but they're not part of this review. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna wrap all these up with a bow and I'm gonna compare them directly. Right now, this review is focused solely on the KEF. So be patient with me and then you'll have something to compare it to. But what I will tell you up front is that the KC62 has about five decibels more in output capability than the SVS 3000 micro from about 20 Hertz to about 30 or 40 Hertz or so. And then when you get to 40 Hertz, the gap starts to close and the SVS has more output. So the bottom line for this subwoofer is that it's super small. It fits without being seen pretty much anywhere. I mean, it really is a marvel. At lower volumes, it does a good job at getting down into 20 Hertz. I was surprised actually that it did as well as it did. But as you increase the volume, that compression limiting built into it, that kind of, that bummed me out. I wish, I wish there was some super subwoofer that didn't have to have that built into it. That was also this small, but you're not going to get around that unless you step up to a really, really good 10 inch a 12 inch or a 15 inch. So you're just not gonna get out of that kind of compression limiting. I've seen this in all my other tests of all other huge subwoofers. So you've just got to be realistic. If the first thing out of your mouth is, well, I bet a 15 can do better. Yeah, the 15 is gonna do better, dude. But if you need something small, then give it a shot. You know, it's hard for me to say that it's the subwoofer to get because I don't need it. You know, I just frankly don't need it. But if I were in an apartment, maybe in a smaller room or something like that, and I listened at reasonable volume, it'd be worth a shot. In a large, large room, nah, just go ahead. If you're in a large room, just get you a large subwoofer. Get you a large subwoofer. This is not a toy though. This thing is legit. There's tons of engineering behind it. And wait till you guys see the KF92 results because that's also very impressive. Okay, I'll talk to you all later. I will do affiliate links for this if you're interested in buying it. It doesn't change the data. You've seen the data, okay? The data is rock solid. The data is the data. But if you're interested in buying it and you want to use an affiliate link, please consider doing that because that does help this channel out and that generates some income for me that helps me do other stuff that I'm doing. 
Uh, also, if you want to be a Patreon or join me at patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner, that would be cool. I would appreciate that. And if you have any questions, as always, please feel free to ask. Hopefully I've covered everything here. Uh, the data will be available on my website sometime in the next week or two. Just give me a little bit of time. I'll talk to you all later. Take care. Peace.